you know, there's this electricity at this, this event. I'd love to bring that to the climate science uh, <laughs> meetings that I go to. And I, I will. I'm going to do that because it makes uh, the events more, you know, fun and, you know, to the extent that climate change is fun. Um, um, so I've dedicated my professional career to understanding ice climate interactions in, in Greenland. And so I want to share with you some of what I've learned to, um, to transfer that knowledge to you. And it's a strange privilege to bear the, the climate change message because it's often kind of a bummer. And it's a, it's a, you know, something that, you know, we don't want to worry really about. We want to find ways to move forward. And I loved hearing that at the introductory remarks of this event, that we need to look forward, we need to move forward, and we can and we need to, we must because of the challenge that, that climate change uh, presents us with. And I learned something from Bill McKibben about the power that exists if we get outside of our comfort zone. And it's not easy to stand out. And everything that we're kind of message from society is, is not to go out far. But I know that this community is doing that, and you're pushing the boundaries. And, and we need to do that in terms of engaging the climate change, which arguably is the defining issue of this century. Dark Snow is a project. It was the first internet crowdfunded uh, Arctic expedition. And it was, we engaged with, uh, with media and social media, and we were able to really amplify our message. And I've learned a lot, and we'll, we'll take that forward in climate communications. Um, this dark material you see accumulating on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet, um, part of it, uh, not a small part, is bacteria. So the ice sheet surface is fermenting also. And it's very important for climate change because it's a multiplier, and I'll talk about that um, in a bit. The world's largest island, I like to call it the world's smallest continent, Three times the area of France, 81% ice covered. It's a dome of ice, more than three kilometers thick. And as it melts, it contains enough ice to raise sea level seven meters. The story for me in Greenland began with 11 years of installing and maintaining a network of automatic weather stations, climate stations, designed to measure the balance of energy coming down and upward. And that gave me the, the exciting job of touring around Greenland each year. And I don't know if I would do this today, but it was very important to level those radiometers so that we could calibrate satellite measurements and to understand if, if the satellite data were accurate. And indeed they were. And these, these data are of the surface reflectivity of, of ice. You, you know snow and ice to be very reflective and it's the impurities that, that darken the ice. That's part of the dark snow message. So here's the year 2000. I'm gonna fast forward to year 2012 and look at the color change of the ice sheet. I'll go back to 2000, forward to 2012. And what we've observed with this high quality record of satellite data is the darkening of the ice sheet, 7% darker in just 12 years. This is equivalent with about twice the United States energy consumption. And that's going into additional heating of the ice sheet surface. It's about 400 times the Danish um, annual energy consumption, going into heating ice uh, and some of that into melting. There's this word albedo or whiteness, and the, this leaf on the frozen lake surface illustrates you know, that darker objects absorb more sunlight, and that produces some local melting, and that locally melted area is darker than the surroundings, and this has a multiplying effect. This is the albedo feedback. 
just a time lapse of melting snow. And just in one day, we, we measure the, the, the reflectivity of the surface declining. That's the power of melt. And you can see it here on the microscopic scale that fresh ice crystals have these jagged edges that scatter light. And that's what makes fresh snow so reflective. And it's heat that, that rounds those crystals, and they simply scatter less light. That's half of the, the story. Meanwhile, uh, a reconstruction I published shows uh, the last decade of, of temperatures being the warmest in at least 170 years. Ten years ago, we couldn't really say that. It, it was maybe the 1920s were warmer. But just in the last ten years, we can now conclude that not only is it the warmest decade in the last 100, the warmest summer in the last 170 years in Greenland, but zooming out to the pre-instrumental record from an ice core, it's now reasonable to conclude that this decade is the warmest since 860 years ago when the Norse settled Greenland. That intervening cold period we call the Little Ice Age And I think it's very reasonable to, um, that we understand that, that it's um, industrial pollution that, that is a main source, a main driver of this. Um, according to the position statements of all scientific academies around the world, there's no longer any doubt that human activity has become a force of, of nature. And that, in fact, according to a mountain of, of data, um, human activity is by far the largest single um, agent for change in, in our environment. And we can put the climate change story aside and just consider the impact that we have on rearranging our, um, our environments, um, how we've re-sculpted um, the surface of, of the earth. When you fly over it, you can see that. And these curves are kind of what set my uh, career in motion, I, I saw these spikes in um, heat trapping gases, and I, and I thought, OK, I want to work on this problem. That was about 20 years ago. These are the greenhouse gases. And it was the Industrial Revolution that, that set these, these data spiking upward. And we see that in the, the red line is the uh, instrumental record. And it shows this warming trend. And the, the lines to the left are the pre-instrumental reconstructions from tree rings, corals, lake sediments, et cetera, that you can see the medieval warm period, the little ice age, and then this rocket ride that we're on now. We're on this rocket, and it's, it's started to blast off. And that happened in the Industrial Revolution. And you can see how steep that is. This is called the hockey stick because it, it resembles that. And we bear witness now to abrupt climate change within our lifetimes. We are in uncharted territory. This isn't something in the future. We, we've just gotten off the launch pad. I think it's going to get, uh, unfortunately, a lot more interesting, to put it mildly. We are going to go past the so-called two-degree guardrail that's about four Fahrenheit there, um, where all countries in, in Copenhagen in 2009 signed that, um, that, that anything above 4 Fahrenheit or 2 Celsius was put us into dangerous climate change territory. The, the red curve there, that's the trajectory. And that's what we have a chance to influence now. Small changes, we can, we can change that. And that's the challenge that we have today, is to aim for uh, a, a, an to restabilize climate. And in terms of the food system, this is, of course, destabilizing agricultural system. And we've known this for quite some time. Um, remember this name, James Hansen, who published this in 1987. And this was a temperature change that showed that most of the warming was in the Arctic, far away from where, where people are. And here's a modern version of that graphic that shows that most of the warming is concentrated in the Arctic. Climate models uh, for about four decades now have been reproducing this amplified warming in the high latitudes, in the Arctic. 
And you can see in these two different scenarios, um, the, the top one is um, the world gets serious about stabilizing carbon dioxide emissions. The bottom one, the fossil fuel intensive scenario, that's business as usual. Um, the short-term economic problems always trump the long-term planning. And, and those, those, that's the choice that we have, really, is between these two futures. And you can see most of the warming is in the Arctic. Why is that? It's because of that reflectivity feedback that a darker surface absorbs more sunlight. And, and if the snow cover and the sea ice goes away, you have a much darker surface that's absorbing more. That's why most of the, the temperature changes in the Arctic. Okay, and, and these are measurements of Greenland. How is Greenland ice reacting to that? And we see a doubling in the loss rate of, of Greenland ice from about a half a millimeter per year sea level rise um, in the first, in just 10 years ago and, and doubling. So n today Greenland's contributing more than a millimeter per year to global sea level rise. Antarctica, the Antarctic ice sheet much bigger, nine times the volume. It's more of a sleeping giant, it's starting to wake up. We, there's evidence of that, it's a similar curve. Greenland is contributing twice Antarctica these days, more than that for the last 20 years. So it's like Greenland's the, the sleeping giant that's awakening with a hangover, and um, it's, uh, you know, it's not too pretty. Um, these are sea level reconstructions, and the, the hump you see in the middle, that's the medieval warm period. And then you go down into the Little Ice Age where we saw ice advancing around the world. The, the dark black line then is the instrumental record and it shows um, the, the beginning of, of what is projected to be a kind of a hockey stick in, in uh, sea level. By the end of this century, we should see something like a meter and a half or more and we cannot rule out much larger uh, sea level rise because um, really small changes in that non-linear curve can produce big differences in going into the future. And I think that underscores the, the message that we, we need to influence the initial conditions now. Now's the time when we, when we can. And some of that is underway. And, and we really need to get behind that. And it's, it's not just in science and policy, but I, I think in every segment of the economy, every activity. And I, I, I can see that the, the food movement is starting to lead in, in this and to do local um, local food and, and local production that we're not eating the thousand mile salad. And that's very important, of course, that also you get that message out and why it's important. Because even with today's CO2 concentrations, if the ice and climate could equilibrate to that, we already have cooked in about 20 meters of sea level rise. That's with today's CO2 concentration. And that's what these data show that there's somehow a functional relationship and it's, it's uncertain. And, and we don't know how fast we get 20 meters of sea level rise. It will probably take centuries. Um, and we, to forge policy, we have to do that um, with deep uncertainty. So it's, it's very challenging, of course, to do this in a way that's not disruptive. Let me take you to the world's fastest glacier. Um, there on the, the western ice sheet, a place called Iluliset, that means icebergs. This 1946 photo shows that it took about 100 years for this world's fastest glacier to retreat um, about 10, 15 kilometers. And then just 10 more years, um, this, the ice shelf in front of this glacier broke up. That's been since 1997 that that began. And that's what this looks like. The blue bar is the historical observed front of this glacier. And then in 2002, 2003, it loses an area of um, the, the dashed line across. That's the area of Copenhagen. And, and this fastest glacier is retreating. As we were, we were observing this, we set up some time-lapse cameras. And I have this privilege to share with you the largest iceberg calving event ever captured um, on, on film. And there's, there's not an audio track here, so you'll have to use your imagination, the sound that this kind of event could, could take. But in just 90 minutes, an area of eight square kilometers um, goes away. And we were shooting a camera every 30 seconds. 
So you'll see eight square kilometers go away, and in about 20 seconds, it, it goes in, in a few stages. And the cliff that's left behind is taller than any of the buildings in Copenhagen. I try to give you a sense of the scale, which is, is difficult. But uh, let's just watch this um, short animation that, that, that illustrates how quickly ice goes away, and it takes a long time to build up. It's kind of a sawtooth pattern. It takes a long time to build up the ice. It goes quickly. Here we go. When that ice moves away from the front of this glacier, it, there's less flow resistance, and it's, it's tripled in speed um, in the last 10 years, this, this glacier. That illustrates the, the profound acceleration that, that we can observe. Let me talk about dark snow. We observe an increase in the fire season. In Colorado, where I'm from, there's two months longer fire season in the last 60 years. This is also happening in the Arctic tundra fire, which is a natural process, but that's, that's increasing in, in time. So that's the, the wildfire component, probably the most important for dark snow. But we're also concerned about um, ship traffic in the Arctic that's increasing. Dark light absorbing material from industrial pollution, and if drilling occurs in, in uh, Greenland, we uh, in the Arctic, we, we're trying to understand this. So we, we actually made an expedition to Greenland this year. We gathered samples, and the, the samples are at NASA now, and we're, we're actually dis d distinguishing wildfire from industrial source in terms of, of its, its um, impact and trying to unravel this, this um, multiplying feedback loop. So you can go to darksnowproject.org to learn more about that. Um, we, we're very fortunate to have um, satellite observations which give us, for example, daily views of where the fires are. And this is just a typical June um, where we've got active fires uh, upstream of Greenland. And this fire in Labrador was the most obvious case. It's going on for a number of days. And we were able to, by looking at these data, to find um, a few cases when we, we could see smoke drifting in contact with the Greenland ice sheet surface. And then we confirmed this with atmospheric trajectories that this material was arriving. <coughs> with my remaining two minutes, I want to uh, upscale, try to put this in, into significance. And, and perhaps the most important thing is, is our changing weather. Because as the Arctic warms at about twice the rate of the lower latitudes, we actually have a slowing down of this river of air in, uh, high above the surface. This jet stream is moving more slowly and it's meandering more. And that gives us more persistent weather. And that could be more persistent warm weather, more persistent cold weather. And I, we've already felt some of that. We've had some cold winters. We've had some hot winters. We've, we've, we start to see this less stable uh, climate. And this is where climate and weather overlap. And that can produce drought or too much water, too little water. Um, and that, is, I think, is really what's most challenging about our agricultural system. So here's, here's James Hansen that I mentioned earlier. He's been called this, this historic figure, the Paul Revere who, is, who warned Americans that um, the British were invading, and he's been called the Paul Revere of climatology. And he's outside of his comfort zone for the sake of his grandchildren getting arrested at the White House, protesting a, a pipeline that, if it's connected, virtually guarantees this climate chaos that, that we need to work together to stop. There were more than 1,000 people arrested in, in front of the White House. Um, it was a, a transgenerational um, movement. This was the largest um, act of civil disobedience in more than a, a generation in the United States. And 
And I drew a lot of fire to, from participating in this as a scientist because we, we should not advocate, we should just deliver facts. But you know, when, when you have kids, it's a lot easier to make that decision. Um, I'll wrap up by s pointing out, I think what we know we need to do is to stop treating nature just as a commodity, but to, to give nature value just to exist and to confront the consumer culture that is really the source of, of a lot of our problems in sustainability. We know that we're, we're harvesting too much, and that's why this needs to happen sustainably. And that's the challenge, the balancing act. This phrase, um, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the needs of future generations. Who knows what, what year, what decade this, this uh, statement was, was developed? A few hands. This was 1987. That's when we first come to terms with this, this concept that we need to develop without compromising the future. That is not long ago. So we've got, um, we're, we're reacting quickly. And, um, and I think thanks to the food movement, in, a, in no small part, we can make um, this balancing act. Thank you. <laughs>